Okay, so let's go ahead and get started again. Uh, we had quite a bit to cover, uh, so let's keep moving. All right, measures of association. So, so far we've done uh, different measures to describe uh, an individual variable. So, if we're looking at, let's say, just income, we've looked at the mean of income, and then a number of different ways to measure the variation in the data of income. Okay? We've looked at just the measures of an individual variable. But now we might be interested in knowing about the relationship between two variables. In fact, we will find in this, in this program that that's one of the most important things that we're interested in. So let's think about it. If, let's say that I'm interested in measuring the impact of a development program. Let's say that my development program is providing fertilizer to farmers in northern Ghana. Well then I would be really interested to know about the, amount, about the relationship between income and fertilizer use. There's two different variables. We've already thought about income a bunch. But let's think about the fertilizer variable now. That's another random variable. How much fertilizer a farmer uses. Now I might be very interested in the relationship between those two variables. I'd be very interested to know when the amount of fertilizer that a farmer uses goes up, does that imply that farmers' incomes go up? Or does it imply that the farmer's incomes go down? Or maybe there's no effect. Maybe a change in the amount of fertilizer um, isn't related to a change in the amount of income. You see how that would be a really important thing to know, an important thing to study, is the relationship between two variables. So let's talk about a couple measurements of that. This is measures of association. So association between two variables. We might, here's some, some examples. Um, taller people tend to weigh more than shorter people. There's positive, some positive relationship. Um, students who study more will tend to get higher grades than those who study less. There's a positive relationship. They, the students that study more have higher grades on average than the students that study less. So there's, there's a positive relationship. As studying goes up, grades go up. As height goes up, weight goes up. Heavier vehicles tend to get worse gas mileage than lighter vehicles. It's a negative relationship. As the weight of a vehicle goes up, the gas mileage goes down. So there's a negative relationship. I was saying before with this, with this development program that provides fertilizer to farmers, we're really interested to know how these two variables relate. When fertilizer quantity goes up, does yields go up, does incomes go up? We'd really like to know that relationship. So let's think about some measurements of that. Okay, so we want to think about how do we measure the relation between these two variables. Well, one measure is called the covariance. So I just want to think about this conceptually. The covariance measures how much the variance in the two variables overlap with each other. That's kind of a conceptual idea. So let's go back to thinking about the concept of variance. We were saying before, we used this example of farmers and incomes. We had one distribution of farmers where um, you know, their, their, their incomes were really, really close to the middle. They were all right around 10,000 Ghana cities. And then we had another population where it was really dispersed. There was a lot of variation. Let's think about that second one. There's a lot of variation. There's a lot of farmers that have high incomes. There's a lot of farmers that have low incomes. The, the covariance, now let's think about fertilizer. We're adding fertilizer variable to the story. The covariance is going to be how much the variation in the fertilizer variable overlaps with the variation in the income variable. So the, co the, the covariance will be high, let's say, if when fertilizer is near the top of its distribution, fertilizer is really high, that incomes will be really high. The covariance will be really low if the, the uh, fertilizer, if when the fertilizer is, 
is in the low end of their distribution, if at the same time income is at the high end of its distribution, then the covariance is going to be low. So it's how much does the variation kind of correlate with each other? Does that make any sense? Just conceptually. A simple way of thinking about it. If when fertilizer go up, income goes up, then there's high covariance. If when fertilizer goes down, incomes go up, there's low covariance. They don't, they don't covary. Actually, I should correct that. If when there are variations in fertilizer, let's say fertilizer goes up and then income doesn't, then there's no covariance, low covariance. They don't vary with each other. The variation in income is not explained by the variation in fertilizer. Okay. That's more precise. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Okay. So there's a mathematical expression of it. We won't take the time to go into it. Okay. Let's look at this next one. To gain an understanding of the strength of relationship, we must Okay, here we go. Covariance can tell us the direction of a relationship, but not the strength, because it is heavily influenced by the units in which the data is measured. To gain an understanding of the strength of a relationship, we must eliminate those pesky units of measurement. We accomplish this by, by dividing the covariance by the standard deviation. All right, so this is going to be the most important one, the correlation coefficient. The correlation coefficient tells us how strongly two variables are correlated with each other. So if when fertilizer goes up, income goes up a lot, then we're going to have a high correlation coefficient. If when, if when fertilizer goes up, nothing happens to income, then we're going to have a correlation coefficient near zero. If when fertilizer goes up, incomes go down, then we'll have a, a, a strong negative correlation coefficient. Correlation coefficients will be really important, so we want to keep this in the back of our mind. It's a number that measures how much the variation in two variables kind of match each other. So here, you're just going to give us an idea. If the correlation coefficient between two variables, let's say income and fertilizer, if it's negative one, that means it's perfectly negative linear relationship. That means Every time the fertilizer goes up, incomes go down. Every single time. Every time, we go, every time fertilizer goes up, incomes go down. That would be a perfect negative correlation. If you have negative 0.8, that's a strong negative correlation. That would be most of the time when fertilizer goes up, incomes go down. Or when fertilizers go up a lot, incomes go down a decent amount. Okay. But then let's go up to zero. If there's no correlation, if the correlation coefficient is zero, that means fertilizer can go up, nothing happens to income. Fertilizer can go down, nothing happens to income. They're not related to each other. And then up, let's go all the way to positive one. This would be that when fertilizer goes up, income always goes up. Does that make sense? Fertilizer goes up, income goes up. Fertilizer goes down, income goes down. So it be really important. We would really like to know the correlation coefficient between fertilizer and income if we wanted to measure the impact of a fertilizer development program, a program that provides fertilizer to farmers. We would really like to know this if we wanted to understand the impact of a fertilizer development program on farmers' income. Does that make sense? And if the correlation, and let me put this in the form of a question. If the correlation coefficient between fertilizer and income is negative, let's say it's negative 0.8, would you recommend providing fertilizer to farmers? No. Why? Because it's doing the opposite of what you intended the program to do. Exactly. You, I mean, we would think that we want to help farmers' incomes go up. If giving them, if if using fertilizer makes their incomes go down then we probably don't want to give them fertilizer. Okay, does that make sense? Is this important? This will be really important in econometrics. Correlation coefficient. So we just, but just understand it conceptually. We don't do the math by hand. All right? 
We want to understand it conceptually. Okay. All right. Okay. Let's see. I think I can go back. Yeah, here we go. Measures of relative standing. Okay. Now, this is going to be a measurement of where a particular data point falls within its distribution. Okay. It's a, me a measure of relative standing. Okay, let's use our example. Let's use our example from, from, from our illustration, right? Let's imagine that when you drew your sample data, you drew 100. And we might want to know how extreme of a value is 100. Is 100 uh, really rare? Is it really low in the distribution? Is it high? You know, how far away is 100 from the mean? We want to have some measurement of how extreme a variable, is, uh, I'm sorry, a value, a particular value is. We can easily say 100 is a pretty extreme value in our population. Whereas 800 is not very extreme. 800 is really close to the mean. 100 is really far away from the mean. 1700 is really far away from the mean. 1000 is really close. So we might have some measure to tell us how extreme a value is. Yeah? What we might use is something called a z-score, or a z-statistic. Later we'll see something called a t-statistic. It's closely related. So what we want to do is we want to measure how extreme a particular value is in terms of standard deviations. We talked about how earlier standard deviations are a really helpful unit because they tell us um, they tell us how far away we are from the mean, and we do it, it does it in the same units as the mean, right? So when we said that you know our our, our, our population mean income was 900 and the standard deviation was 394, this was a very intuitive measurement. Okay, so let's use standard deviations. How? In terms of standard deviations, how far away is 100 from the mean? How many standard deviations is 100 from the mean? That's going to give us a measurement of how extreme of a value 100 is. OK, so let's look at that. Here is how we calculate the z-score. The z-score is a number. It's the number of standard deviations that a given individual data value is away from the mean. How far away is 100 from the mean in terms of standard deviation? That's what we're looking at. All right? And the way that we measure that is what we do is we take that individual data point. So this would be, in our case, in our example, 100. We would take 100 minus the population mean. That's 900. 100 minus 900 divided by the standard deviation. And that would give us how far away 100 is from the mean in, in terms of standard deviation. How is the number of standard deviations that value is from the mean. If you remember earlier, I might go all the way back. I might go all the way back to, to show us this. Uh, here we go. Now we said, if you remember, if, if we have a mean, if we have the mean between one standard deviation below and one standard deviation above is 68% of the data. Do you remember that? If you go two standard deviations below, two standard deviations above, that will give us 95% of the data. Three standard deviations to three standard deviations will give us 99% of the data. So standard deviation is a very valuable tool to measure how far away we are. This z-score is going to tell us how many standard deviations are you away from the mean. Let's say that your z-score was three. Would you say that that's an extreme value? A very unlikely value. Actually, let me say that. When I say extreme, I mean very unlikely. Okay? V 
very low or very high. Okay. If my z score was three, would you say that's an extreme value? What does that mean? Yeah. It's extreme? Yeah. If my standard deviation, I'm sorry, if my z score was negative one, is that an extreme value? What is that? It is it's extreme? If it's negative one. Negative one, that's extreme. So that means we're here? Yeah, that's, it's harder to tell. It's kind of close, but it's also kind of far. It's not obvious. We might not call that extreme. If we was three, that means we're all the way up here. That means it's very unlikely. It is very unlikely to get that number. Let's say I had a, a z-score of negative 0.1. Is that, is that extreme or very common? What do you think? Extreme or common? Very extreme. It's very extreme. Negative 0.1. If my z score is negative 0 0.1, it's what? It's common? It's not common. What do you think? Very common. What do you think? Negative 0.1. Negative 0.1. So what, what I'm saying is negative 0 0.1. There's no extreme. It's common. Yeah. Common? What do you think? Did you say common? Okay. It's very common. It was really close to the mean. Right? Because this is in, this is in yeah. standard deviations. Three standard deviations is really rare. It's very extreme. Man, that is really unlikely. 0.1 standard deviations, that is extremely likely. Does that make sense when we look at this? Right? Yeah. The smaller that number is, the, the smaller in absolute value terms mm -hmm. to the mean, the closer we are to zero, the more likely that that value is. The larger in, in, in absolute value terms, so either more positive or more negative, the more extreme the value is, the more unlikely that value is. All right, so then that's our z-score. It's closely related to what's called a t-score, or a t-statistic, which we'll talk about later. Anyways, so here is our z-score. Ordinary values, okay, maybe that's between negative 2 and 2. Unusual values between 2 and negative 3. But then the farther, we, the farther out we go, that's when it gets extreme. It's outliers, very unlikely data points. Okay. Okay. Oh, I had it here. That's great. Yeah. Smart. <laughs> Put it there. Really helps uh, uh, articulate it. Okay. I think we have it. Do you guys think we have we have that? Alright. Let's get going. Alright, we did measure the association. Alright, distributions. We already talked about distributions a little bit, we're just gonna talk about it a little bit more. Alright. A function that gives us the probability of a particular data point will occur. Alright, we talked about this before. It's a standard normal distribution. A standard normal distribution is a, a, a distribution like we've talked about, where the mean value is zero. It means the data is all centered around zero, and the standard deviation is one. It's a standard normal distribution. Very common in statistics, we look at standard normal distributions. Normal distributions in general. So a, a, a normal distribution is just a distribution that looks and functions like this. A standard normal is one where the mean is zero and the standard deviation is one. But you could have a normal distribution with, with a mean of two and a standard deviation of a hundred, you know. We could have lots of different normal distributions. Uh, the function, the actual function that gives you the, the, the normal distribution is this. That's the function of a normal distribution. You don't need to know that. Um, but that's the formula for a normal distribution. Right. 
If you want to know what kind of normal distribution you have, you have to have two parameters, the mean and the standard deviation. If you plug the mean and the standard deviation into that function, you will have a particular distribution, a particular normal distribution. If your mean is zero and your standard deviation is one, then what kind of normal distribution do you have? A standard, a standard normal distribution. Okay. So the normal distribution is an arrangement of a data set in which most values cluster in the middle of the range and the rest taper off symmetrically towards either extreme. So it's the most, it's the, it's the neatest looking distribution. It's where everything's near the middle and it's symmetric and it goes off to the extremes at either end. We can imagine other distributions. I'll just, I'll just draw one. We can imagine a distribution that maybe looks more like this. Here's a distribution where the mean is over here, but it's not symmetric. It's skewed. There's, 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 this might be income. You have zero down here, very, very few people have zero. But most people earn, let's say, most, most family, most households in northern Ghana earn 10,000 Ghana cities a year. But you have a couple of households in northern Ghana that make 100,000 Ghana cities. But very, very, very few. This might be what the income distribution looks like. A whole lot of people earn 10,000 a year. Very few, nobody makes zero, but very few people make like really low amounts. But you have some people that make a whole lot. And so your distribution kind of, is kind of skewed way out on the top of that. So we can have distributions that look different. You see what I'm saying? But the normal distribution is really convenient. We, we run into it a lot. We'll oftentimes assume things have a normal distribution. When I say, when we take econometrics and I say that the error terms we assume have a normal distribution, this is what we assume that they look like. This is the distribution that they look like. Makes sense? All right. Um, they can have different means. So here's an example. Um, we have a standard normal distribution. The mean is zero and the, stand, and the standard deviation is one. This is kind of the notation. Here we go. Here's the notation. If something is distributed with a normal distribution, the notation is n, and then the mean, comma, the standard deviation. Okay. So the blue line here is a standard normal, mean zero, standard deviation one. The orange line is a normal distribution that has a standard deviation of one still, so it's the same amount of variation, but the mean is negative one, so it's just shifted to the left. And then here we have an example of a normal distribution, same standard deviation, standard deviation of one, but the mean is one, so it's shifted to the right. Okay. That just gives us some visualization. Does, does that resonate with you? Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. where, the, where the mean is located, so on the orange one, the mean is located at negative one. But the gray one, the mean's located at one. No distributions can have different standard deviations. We kind of alluded to this earlier. So here's a standard normal. If the standard deviation shrinks, that means we have less variation in the data, and your normal distribution will look more like this. Standard deviation of 0.5. If your standard deviation increases, that means there's more variation. And it gets wider. So that's what this might this distribution might look like. Right? So more variation it gets wider, less variation it gets skinny. <coughs> and you can change the mean, and it moves. So the normal is bisymmetric. It's symmetric, it's, it's, yes, on either side it's symmetric. So you go up and you go down by the same amount. Yeah. Another common distribution is called a uniform distribution. This is where the probability of every, object, of every possible data point Every possible data point, remember I said a random variable is a variable that takes different values from a predetermined set of values. 
A normal distribution is a distribution where the probability is the same for every possible value that the variable can take. And so the distribution is just flat. So for the red one, it can take a value between 1 and 6. And the probability of getting 1, or getting 2, or getting 3, or getting 4, or getting 5, or getting 6 is the same. And then the blue one can take a value between 4 and 12. And the probability of getting any of those values is the same. It's a uniform distribution. Okay. Those are common distributions. I mentioned the standard normal. Okay. Sample distribution. So the sampling distribution, yeah, just talk about this conceptually. The sample distribution is the distribution that you have in the sample that you have collected. Right, so let's look at this. So normally we use samples rather than populations because it's much easier to get data on just a sample, right? We talked about that earlier. However, we know that our sample mean is probably not a perfect representation of the population mean. If we had taken a different random sample, we would get a different sample mean. Remember, we did that. This is one sample mean, we take another sample, we get a different sample mean. We take another sample, we get a different sample mean. Right? So we've, we've, we've illustrated that. Every time we take a sample from the data, we'll get a different mean. We'll get a different standard deviation. So how do you know if the sample you took was representative of the population? We can take all possible samples of the population, calculate the mean for each, and create a distribution of the sample means. I was alluding to this earlier, right? I was saying that the sample mean is itself a random variable. Right? It's a variable, it can take different values. It takes different values every time you go and collect the sample. You get a different sample mean. So the sample mean itself is a random variable. That means it has a distribution. There's some probability of getting this sample mean. There's some probability of getting this sample mean. There's some probability of getting this sample mean. Now, if you had to guess, what is the distribution? What kind of distribution does the, does the sample mean have? What kind of distribution? I've alluded to two, really, so far a uniform distribution, and a normal distribution. So pick between those two. Do you think that the distribution of sample means would follow a uniform distribution or a normal distribution? And let's just remember what those are. A uniform distribution has the same probability for every possible value, and a normal distribution is symmetric, where the the most likely value is the mean, and then the least likely values are farther away from the mean. So do you, what, do you, what distribution do you think the sample mean is going to fall up? We have a vote for a normal. Did I hear? Vote for normal. Vote for normal. Uniform. A vote for uniform. All right, so we've got three to one. So the standard, I'm sorry, the sample mean is going to follow a normal distribution. And it's going to follow a normal distribution no matter what, here's the, this thing's going to blow your mind, no matter what the distribution of the population is, the sample mean is going to follow a normal distribution. That means the most common value is going to be the mean. Now remember, we did this, we took the average of all these, we took the mean of the sample means, and it was really close to 900. Means, and, and in, a, in a normal distribution, let's just, let's just look at a normal distribution. In a normal distribution, the most likely value is the mean. You're, re, you're, you're a lot more likely to pick a value at the mean than you are to pick a value way out in one of the extremes. Okay. The distribution of a sample mean is going to follow a normal distribution. 
the most likely sample mean that you will get anytime you take a sample from your data set, or from your data, every time you take the sample from your data, the most likely value of your mean, of your sample mean, is the population mean. Follows a normal distribution. Okay. That's a really neat thing. Hopefully. All right. That derives from the what's called the central limit theorem. We're not going to go into the details, but I, I've, I've hit the point. Okay. So I want to do one more thing. So if we draw samples of size n over and over again from the population of sample n, each sample will provide a different estimate of the population mean or the population proportion. The difference between the sample mean and the population mean is called the sample error. The sample means and the proportions themselves will follow some probability distribution. That's what I was just saying before, right? It's going to follow a normal distribution. Okay, we're going to skip over this. Okay, there's one last thing that's going to be really important for us to know. This sample mean is going to follow a normal distribution, like I've said. The mean of the sample means, which we, which we showed, the mean of the sample means is going to be the population mean, right? We calculated that. It was really close, right? We took the mean, we took the average of all of our sample means, and it was really close. I bet if we did, I bet if we did four more draws and took the average, we would be almost dead on 900, okay? So the mean of the sample mean is the population mean. At this point, I'll just maybe clarify something. Another way of saying the mean is the expected value. And here's the notation for it. If you have E of something, if you have E of a random variable, that means it's the average. So E of a random variable, that means it equals the average. It's called the expected value. It's the same thing as the mean. So the expected value, or the mean, of the sample mean is the population mean. And then we also want to know the standard deviation of the sample mean. This is really important. We are like really getting important here. Especially when we do econometrics. The standard deviation of the sample mean is called well, it's calculated as this. It's the standard deviation from your sample data divided by the square root of your sample size. So I'm going to pause there. I'm going to pause there, and we're going to do one of the exercises from the workbook.